Hi, I'm Steve Clemens, and I have a question. Are journalists and the media undermining our societies? Let's get to the bottom line. With so much mayhem in the news business these days, it's hard to keep track of who's in and who's out and where different media outlets stand on the issues. In case you didn't catch it, America's biggest news host, Tucker Carlson, is out at Fox News, but he's now in at Twitter, which he says is the last place on earth where you can find free speech. Other household names have recently been fired, and major companies like CNN are trying to rebrand themselves. And some famous news platforms like BuzzFeed have just pulled the life support plug on themselves. Despite the disruption and a lot of innovation, confidence and trust in media is at a real crisis point. So is the news supposed to enlighten people and broaden their worldview, or go narrow and just reinforce people's biases? Is this the new normal? Today we're talking with a journalist who's had a front row seat to all the changes in modern day journalism. Ben Smith was in the launch team at Politico. He worked as the top media writer for the New York Times, and he created the news department at BuzzFeed and recently co-founded a brand new news organization, Semaphore, where in full disclosure, I also work. He's just come out with a book, Traffic, Genius, Rivalry, and Delusion in the Billion Dollar Race to Go Viral, that tells the story of the social media revolution's impact on the news business. Ben, it's great to have you on my show. It not only tells the impact of social media on the news business, it also talks about the social, you know, the impact of social media on society. And I'm really interested, just to start with the big question, is this is what has led to the toxicity of our times? Has social media really undermined our democracy? I mean, I, I guess the way I see it, and thanks for having me on, Steve, yeah. is that... Um, is, is that social media and Facebook in particular were totally bound up with these surges of populism in the 2010s. I mean, I'm not sure if you can see, I mean, you can't really run the counter example if there hadn't been Facebook. But I do think, and the thing that I, I you know, found in reporting the book was the extent to which, particularly the Trump movement in the United States, you know, took these really deeply understood Facebook, digital media, kind of followed its energy to the absolute logical sort of end point, which was, in some sense, Donald Trump. So Donald Trump, who, you know, tweeted and all of this stuff, is the winner in the social media environment. But as I look back at history, the one who was the first winner was Barack Obama. And what did Barack Obama's team see in the social media team that other, you know, progressive Democrats failed to take hold of? Well, you know, you have to sort of put your head back to this world in the early 2000s where, you know, where Facebook is where college kids hang out. The Internet is a set of blogs that are, you know, anti-establishment critical of a mainstream media that has, with notable exceptions, gotten the Iraq war wrong, hmm. isn't really on the Internet, is a bit lost. And there's all this energy first around Howard Dean and then around Barack Obama. And it's really like it's a place for young people. And so it's almost obvious that Barack Obama, kind of young, progressive in the United States, is going to kind of ride this energy. And you've seen similar things happen in Latin America, in Colombia, actually, but all over the world, sort of like young people finding their voices on the Internet, which was, which was presumptively their space. And when, Obra and when Obama visits Facebook in 2011 after his victory, you know, it sort of goes without saying that this is where Democrats hang out. Of course it is. Well, you, you write such an interesting, um, it's, it's almost like an anthropological treatment of the early days of social media. You focus on BuzzFeed and Jonah Peretti. You focus on Nick Denton, who created Gawker, Ariana Huffington and others around her that founded HuffPost. I'm just interested in that moment, and you were there watching all of this come together. In fact, you were sort of, I don't know, they call you the Forrest Gump of it. You were hired by one of them, but you knew all of these characters. What did they get right? What did they get wrong? You know, they were among the first just to see this wave coming. And there's, you know, there was a huge, particularly Jonah Peretti really saw social media was going to be the so central. Jonah Peretti did BuzzFeed. The founder of BuzzFeed yeah. was going to become this central distribution platform. Nick Denton, who founded Gawker, saw the power of the internet to kind of strip away the artifice that, in media. But I think also both to some degree thought they could control these forces and monetize them. And I think that turned out to be a lot harder than they thought. So when you saw this, I mean, you were an early blogger. I was an early blogger. We were I early had the bloggers. Washington Note. I wrote a kind Look of, at us now, I, I mean, I read the book and everything I did in the Washington Note was exactly the opposite of this. I wrote long, wonky foreign policy pieces that nonetheless found an audience in that time, folks, so it wasn't all bad. But I wasn't chasing traffic, you know, per se. I was chasing people who I thought would be thoughtful about these issues, which was a different strategy. But I'm interested when you saw Gawker 
And I was afraid of Gawker. I never wanted to meet Nick Denton or any of his people because they were scandal mongers. Yeah, I mean, his philosophy was that, you know, the, the, that the possibility of the Internet was to publish the things that journalists said to each other in bars, not the things they said on the Internet. Which, by the way, I think you do not give yourself enough scandal mongering credit is some of what you're doing. You were saying mm -hmm. stuff that other people were afraid to say about American foreign policy at a moment of Washington consensus when all the big publications were in one place. And it was a place for outsiders. And, and those that are blogs, which were basically the early social media, were a place where outsiders could kind of throw spitballs at the establishment. And I think an early Gawker and this site called Jezebel, to me, like kind of the iconic thing. They um, tell, tell the folks about Jezebel. Yeah, w w it, was a, it was a feminist blog. It still exists. But in its heyday in 2007, it launched. And the first thing they did was put out a $10,000 bounty for an unretouched photograph of someone in one of these magazines. And they got a picture of Faith Hill, where, where, that, where she still had freckles and smile lines, which had gotten photoshopped out. And it was kind of emblematic of that era's mainstream media, which was photoshopping out a lot, and this sense that the internet could tell you what was really happening. And I think it was all, it was all in some sense, kind of very small scale, people learning how, these, how, how human interest and attention worked online and watching it through, the, through, through traffic until this wave of social media came and, and kind of massively amplified these tactics, these ways of thinking. You know, one of the things that occurred to me when I was reading your book, which I'll tell everyone in the audience, read it. It's, it's a fascinating uh, journey into, a, to, into this time and also what went wrong. But in the days of Walter Cronkite or the big, you know, national network uh, stations or national radio stations, NPR, whatever it may be, more people were listening to those in mass. And, and, and while they were, you know, not designed for small tribes, or small, you basically were forced, to, if you were going to get any news, to have a wider aperture to get fed a lot more than you might otherwise want just for yourself. But as media broke apart, people were fed more and more of just what reinforced their views or what they were comfortable with. And you describe this beautifully in the book. And, and I'm asking myself, is that is what one of the main drivers that has led to the political fragmentation in this country, where people really don't give a damn about someone on the other side of a perspective or a view or a political uh, party? I mean, I'd love to hear how technology has, has basically disrupted you know, our knowledge of the world. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one of the, ab probably the wrong, the thing we were wrongest about at BuzzFeed, where I started in 2012, was we had this theory that when people started sharing news publicly in these public spaces like Facebook, they would be their best selves. They would mm -hmm. want their friends to think they were nice people. They would share appeals for er earthquake rel relief and thoughtful Atlantic articles. Um, and, and thoughtful BuzzFeed news articles. And our slogan for a while was no haters. Or, I mean, we have to admit, admit that BuzzFeed had 10 pretty yeah, puppies. Well, yes, or, but also definitely yeah, like yeah. silly memes and yeah. cute animals, but certainly not like hateful, shouty politics. Like what kind of a person would go out in public and act like that? Everybody will think you're crazy. And obviously we were totally wrong about human yeah. nature mm. at, at some level there. But no, I do think, and I think there were both both the sort of broad moment, how much anger there was, and uh, for which social media was a vessel. But then also there were specific technical things that platforms did to amplify, to, to, you know, and they weren't trying to get Donald Trump elected or whatever. They were trying to move the amount of time you spend on the platform from, you know, 4.7 minutes to 4.9 minutes. And the way they would do that is find what you were most likely to engage. And, th and this metric of engagement and inter interaction wound up amplifying things that you often things that were incredibly divisive, things that were racially divisive, where if you comment, I hate this, it's racist, the machine says, wow, this person is very meaningfully engaged with this content. Let's show it to more people. And I think that really, that in particular, that sort of 2015 to 2017 period on Facebook, there were well, elements that drove these divisions deeper. That said, you know, a lot of that has passed, right? Like, so Donald Trump hasn't been on social media for a while, and it's not like things are that much better. <laughs> Well, I want to get to the trust in media crisis in a moment, but I remember when Donald Trump ran and after he ran, and you know you were responsible uh, in part, you write about it, uh, uh, releasing the dossier, which fed a lot of the paranoia about Russian manipulation of Donald Trump, but also Russian manipulation of kind of the American political uh, sandbox, if you will. And I guess the question I have is when I read it, you know, I don't know what the Russians did or didn't do in terms of feeding toxicity in America. We were doing it on our own, right? There was an awful yeah. lot going on just by the algorithms that Facebook 
was releasing or that other people were doing that had nothing to do with foreign uh, perpetrators. Am I right? Yeah, and in fact, there was, there was a British government report a couple years ago that made pretty clear that I think a lot of commentators, I mean, the, the, the Russians did try to go on Facebook and make things worse, but they were massively overwhelmed by our own ability just to make things worse. And by Facebook, you know, Facebook was amplifying this stuff, but also it was in the politics, it was in the culture. Donald Trump was on cable news saying a lot of this stuff, too. It wasn't solely a Facebook phenomenon. Why are Democrats so bad at it? Well, I mean, I do think, you know, there was this moment when it seemed like Obama liberalism was the thing the Internet was good for, you know, the sort of Huffington Post era. And I just think that if you, you know, you follow the sort of passions, you follow the traffic to its logical extreme, it is often telling people what they want to hear, whether it's true or false, lying to provoke a reaction, saying outrageous things mm. to provoke a reaction, provoke, I guess, what the platforms would call engagement. And actually, when I... I went to meet Steve Bannon, I read about it in the book, in, in Trump Tower in 2016, and he'd made a real study of social media. He'd studied Huffington Post, he had run Breitbart, had just moved to the Trump campaign. And the thing that he was, he, he was very interested in BuzzFeed, and he was very puzzled that we hadn't just backed Bernie Sanders to the hilt. Why, why would you not just follow that traffic, follow that energy, to become to him what Breitbart had been to Donald Trump? And what was your answer? You know, that we had journalistic standards, that we were... You know, I mean, it's a, it feels like a very lame answer, honestly. Like, well, we're just trying to do our jobs as journalists. We're, you know, we think that these institutions, we shouldn't, we're not just going to try to burn down these institutions for fun. Well, when you look at, I mean, you and I have talked about this offline before, but when you look at American attitudes, and I, I think these numbers are reflected globally, frankly, and we're talking to yeah. a big global audience, and a lot of the things I find interesting about your book in the U.S. case are also true oh, when you look sure. around the world and the polarization is going on. But, but, you know, basically more than 53% 50, of, of folks have a very or somewhat unfavorable view of the media. Uh, and, and you've got basically 20% very ambivalent. About 26% are somewhat favorable. This is, I love the people, people do not trust the news. They yeah. do not trust us. They do not trust the media. And I'm interested in culpability and liability. You... I think this has got to be the most sympathetic treatment of true monsters that were out there taking advantage and writing this, in, in my view. Yeah. But how do we heal ourselves after the BuzzFeeds, HuffPost, Gawkers? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm obviously more sympathetic to the monsters. I think that it is general. I think the media loves to exaggerate the media's own role in these things. I mm -hmm. think these technological platforms had a lot of influence, these bigger social forces. But... If you look, but it's also obviously across institutions. One of the things that social media did was, I mean, the thing that social media in some sense turned out to be best at was breaking down institutions and trust in institutions, whether it is the CDC, whether it is a newspaper, whether it's, you know, banks, I mean, or government. And often, by the way, well, it did that by revealing what these things were really doing. Mm. I mean, it's a complicated picture. It's not, like, it's not like the news organizations that we look back fondly in the early 2000s and late 90s were doing such a bang-up job covering the Iraq War. It was just that it wasn't so evident to everybody. And so I think, it's, I think it's very hard to put that genie back in the bottle. I mean, obviously, you know, we are partners in a new news thing, and we're trying to figure it out. But I don't think there's some simple Well, let's solution. talk about Semaphore for a minute. Forget that I worked there and you worked there. But, I mean, how is Semaphore going to address some of the gaps that you've written about between essentially content and substance and the thrill of chasing Traffic. Yeah, well, I mean, I think one thing, for better or for worse, is I think people are sick of this, of that sort of stuff, of going on Facebook or Twitter and seeing this chaotic, kind of confusing, but like lively and fun. I don't think anybody thinks that's fun anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think actually consumers have moved on and are interested in help navigating this chaos. And, and but they, I think they are not basically. A lot of people are not about to go tr back to trusting faceless institutions. They want to know who they're hearing from. They want a level of transparency about who you are, where you're coming from, what are the facts, what, are your, what is your opinion, which is what we try to do really schematically mm. at Semaphore. Um, and, and I also think that people are, there's, we're not all going back to being all in one place, mm. right? I mean, everyone, the whole world on Facebook and Twitter yelling at each other. I think people are looking for smaller spaces, more intimate conversations they can trust. You know, in that trade-off between views and the quality um, yeah. If Semaphore were to become big, do you think it would be falling into, into the trap of, of views? You know, I mean, it's a ch it is a tricky thing in journalism because you obviously want people to read you. 
Hmm. And I think good journalists have a, a sort of a sixth sense for what are people interested in. And they want to write that story and pick at that scab. And yet, you also know that often the thing that will be most widely read, and this isn't new on the internet, the New York hmm. Sun, the great first kind of breakout New York newspaper in the United States, its big moment was when it published a series on how flying uh, mammals had been found on the moon, a series of scientific reports and sold out for days. I think there's always an impulse in media to tell people what they want to hear. And I think you, you have to resist it. And what happened when, when traffic came around, when all this new flood of data, in some sense, suddenly we're like flying with instruments. And if you wanted to, it could really take you to indulge your worst instincts. You were a Twitter obsessed I know, guy. I know. Um, are you? Go did you go through any kind of withdrawal? Are you still on Twitter all the time? You know, How I last you tweeted like. Tw I mean, I last tweeted twenty six minutes ago or something. But it probably was about how Twitter is dying. I mean, honestly, <laughs> the thing just because I'm a news junkie, and the thing that strikes me about social media is it has lost its basic utility for saying, "Hey, what is happening in the world?" Mm. And I think people are going elsewhere, just to that very basic, like, what, "What's going on?" Twitter, if you spend a lot of time on Twitter, it is sort of in a perverse way fascinating to watch it fall apart. It's like some kind of disaster movie, like it mm. is very in compelling. But it, you can't go there and say, hey, what's happening today? That's just not what it's for anymore. You know, Donald Trump is going to appear on CNN. Why do you think he's doing this? I mean, he's, Donald Trump has always said he, you know, denounced the media, but in a way used that conflict and those denunciations as a springboard for more attention. Mm. And his sort of conflict with the media has always generated attention. And I think, you know, CNN is incredibly, sort of to, uh, to me, a shocking degree, unpopular with Republicans. It's viewed as sort of the enemy, the way a lot of Democrats view Fox, I suppose. Mm. And I think Trump is putting on a show, showing his own strength relative to his competitors, to Ron DeSantis in particular. Let me ask you the question, and, and I hope I can get it out correctly, but when I started my own blog, which was around the time that you started yours, I sort of felt like there was a cartel, an intellectual cartel of the editors at op-ed pages at the major journals of record, the Washington Post, yeah. New York Times, Wall Street Journal. And while a lot of them were saying yes to me and to my colleagues at a think tank, we were still getting told no, and it, and it, and it bothered me that we were being told no. And I wanted a place to put these ideas, which is why uh, the Washington Note became created. But I thought they were lazy, homogenized uh, news organizations that were leaving a lot of interesting stuff on the cutting room floor. And so I saw a market opportunity there to basically cover things that the mainstream press was, like John Bolton's confirmation was a big yeah. issue at that time. But without going you know, too down that rabbit hole, I guess the question is, when you look at the major media today, the New York Times has bought a lot of bloggers. They bought a lot of, they've, they've hired a lot of the people, including formerly yourself, who were of this social media world. What are the vulnerabilities today of the New York Times, of the Washington Post, and others that have tried to become hybrids of these different movements? Yeah, I mean, I think the Times, in, you know, the Times, there's a big, I did not expect to write a book about the internet that was in part about the New York Times, but certainly the Times above all, I think, is one of I mean, the real, praise one of the real winners, basically saying, hey. one of the huge winners of this era. I do think they, for better and for worse, took in a lot of the ideas, a lot of the people from the internet. I mean, part of the challenge is a lot of those ideas and people are inimical to the mm. core ideas of the New York Times. And if you sometimes look at the New York Times and say, wow, why are all these people fighting each other? It's because they hired a bunch of lunatics from the internet and everybody disagrees about everything. And a lot of us have, have since left. But I, but I don't know. I mean, I think it is, and you know, and both of us have a similar arc of thinking that the establishment me media, basically being outsiders to it, mm. you know, waging this sort of digital campaign to change it. And then I think, to some degree, finding ourselves in this apocalyptic landscape where, like, wow, okay, like, very effective challenge to these institutions. They're all sort of in ruins. And, and, and I think, at least in my case, thinking, huh, like, we've got to find ways to build trusted institutions and rebuild them. I think for another new moment where people are looking for direct connections, particularly to individual voices. Well, yeah, I'm thinking the other thing that really strikes me about your book, and it bothers me, frankly, is that you focus on these key individuals who saw, you know, the matrix, as yeah. it were, differently than others. Jonah Peretti, Nick Denton, uh, uh, Kenny Lehrer, Nick, you know, yeah. Ariana Huffington and others. But that w one of the people who was very dissatisfied with sort of the gawker mantra of sexual pictures and, you know, innuendo and, you know, basically scandal mongering, um, 
was Peter Thiel, who's a rich billionaire yeah. and basically took. So we're talking about individuals have massive impact on the news habits of American society or global society, or an individual who gets ticked off and has enough power to bring down one of these news organizations. Are we living in this world of kind of super gladiators where most of us don't matter at all? We're just victims or winners accidentally. But it's all about these individuals who figured out how to amass incredible power. And what does that say about American democracy and the economics of news today? I mean, it, I do, it does feel, I, I totally agree with these, in, these immensely powerful figures, Elon Musk being the main one. Right. I've kind of gotten interested in news as a hobby and what would like to crush their enemies and elevate their friends and like have some theories. Um, yeah, and it's, I mean, it's a great, it's, it is a great story, but also I think a big threat to the industry. Weren't the Salzburgers of the New York Times or the Grahams at uh, the Washington Post those same kind of characters? Well, they were entrepreneurs who were in the news business. I mean, mm. for better and for worse, right? As opposed to people who who made their money, who made billions in tech, and had actually sometimes legitimate grievances with the coverage, and mm. thought, well, I'll just like throw a few pennies this way to destroy my enemies. I mean, I think to some degree it's a feature of this just massive inequality in wealth right now. Let me ask you a more serious question here. We have um, we're a year anniversary out of a, an Al Jazeera journalist being killed in Palestine, Shireen Abu Akla, and it, it's made me think about how journalists are treated all over the world. We have have an uh, Evan Gershkovich who's been taken and, and detained in Russia wrongfully. Um, we have, I think, over 60 that had been killed over this last year. And so when you sort of look at the broad profession of journalism, and I, I know a lot of journalists out there, and they really admire you. They look up to you as setting a certain standard out there. Is there anything we're not doing to remind governments, both democracies and, and autocracies, um, in a way differently about the important role of journalists uh, and journalism in healthy societies? I mean, I do think that journalism is a real threat to power. Hmm. Did, you know, it, the Internet made it, foreign correspondence used to be kind of harmless. If you're the Russian leader and some American journalist is sending off dispatches to appear in a print paper in English, who cares? Now that's visible to your own citizens. Social media amplifies that, too. Um, I mean, you know, and autocrats aren't wrong. I think to see this as a threat to them and to power, but I, but I do certainly think that the, you know, where where democratic leaders are attacking the press, particularly Trump, you know, helps, you know, gives ex extra space for, you know, whether it's Modi or Putin or you know whoever else to crack down on on the press. Well, I want to thank you for joining us, Ben Smith, editor in chief at Semaphore and author of Traffic: Genius, Rivalry, and Delusion in the Billion Dollar Race to go viral. We really appreciate you being with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. So what's the bottom line? I gotta say it, we're not much different than lab rats in a massive media science lab. We get poked and we get provoked with different algorithms designed to elicit certain responses, and we love it. But despite all the technical innovation, the rise of citizen journalists and of blogs and platforms like TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, you rarely get exposed to a range of different thinking. They feed you what you want to hear. Sure, it's great to be comfortable connecting with others in our identity and political tribes, but it's not great to lose the ability to pop out of our filter bubbles and to have our biases challenged and sometimes cross the aisle and even reach an understanding with everyone else. The way the media works nowadays is a real problem. When divisions within a society push up the market value of mega social media companies and when social cohesion is not good for business, then we know the future is going to be riddled with clashes and with controversy and choking democracies. The lab rats we've all become need to find a way out and set up new rules, or else we remain really frustrated little lab rats. And that's the bottom line.